Hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. I'm just carrying on with where I left off last episode, okay? Sometimes when I'm alone in the house, I look at those first photos. Chloe in my arms, Chloe sleeping on my mother's breast. The four of us sitting on the bed in the hospital. My grandmother took that one and it's a bit wobbly, not very well framed. You can see the room in the background. The blue walls, the gifts, the boxes of chocolates. Most of all, you notice mum's face. It's so incredibly smooth and her smile. When I rummage in the little wooden box the photos are kept in, my heart beats like it's going to burst. Mum would go crazy if she caught me. After a few days, they came home. I loved changing Chloe, bathing her, trying to comfort her when she was crying. I rushed back from school to see them. When she started drinking from a bottle, I'd sit on the sofa with my arm propped up on a cushion and give her her f evening feed. I remember you had to be careful about air bubbles and not let them drink too fast. Those moments aren't ours anymore. They're shut up in a box, buried at the back of a cupboard, out of reach. They're frozen, like on a postcard or a calendar. The colours will end up disappearing and fading. They're forbidden to our memories and our words. One Sunday morning, I heard Mum scream. It wasn't a scream, it was a scream I'll never forget. Even today, when I let my mind wander, when I'm not paying attention to where my thoughts are going, when that day floats into my head because I'm bored, that scream comes back to me and tears at my stomach. I ran into the bedroom and saw Mum shaking Chloe, shouting. I didn't understand. She held her against her, shook her again, kissed her. Chloe's eyes were closed. My father was already calling an ambulance and then Mum slid down onto the floor. She was hunched over the baby on her knees, crying and saying, no, no, no. I remember that she was only wearing a bra and pants and thinking that she wasn't suitable if people were coming in. And at the time, I could tell that something was happening, something that couldn't be fixed. The doctors came quickly. They examined Chloe, and I know that Mum saw in their eyes that there was nothing they could do. It was at that moment that Dad realised that I was there and took me out of the room. His face was pale and his lips were trembling. He held me very tight in his arms without saying a word. Then there were the, the announcements. Hushed conversations, endless telephone calls, letters and the burial. And then a huge void like a black hole. We didn't cry that much. Altogether, I mean. Maybe we should have. Maybe that would have made it easier. Life picked up again as before with the same rhythm, the same timetable, the same habits. My mother was there with us, preparing the meals, doing the washing, hanging out the clothes. But it was as if a part of her had gone away to be with Chloe in a place where which only she knew. She extended her first period of sick leave with another, and then another, and then she couldn't work anymore. I was in the last year of primary school. The teacher asked to see my father because she thought my behaviour was abnormal for a child of my age. I was at the meeting. She said that I was withdrawn and solitary, that I displayed a disturbing maturity. I remember those words. She alluded to Chloe's death. The whole school knew about it. She said that it was a great trauma for a family and that each of us risked losing our way that we needed it and that we needed to seek help. She was the one who recommended that my father took me to a psychologist. That's why I went to see Mrs Cortans every weekday, every Wednesday till the end of that year. She made me take IQ tests and other tests with funny names and initials that I can't remember. I went without complaining to make my father happy. I refused to do the drawings and all the stuff psychologists get children to do to work out what they think without really thinking it or without knowing they're thinking it. But I was willing to talk. Mrs Cortans nodded with great conviction and rarely interrupted me. I shared my theories about the world with her. That's when they started. My theory about subsets, my theory about infinite stupidity, about polar necks, equations without unknowns, visible and invisible segments and so on. She really listened and always remembered that I'd said the what I'd said the time before. She would come up and with connections or deductions and I would nod back so as not to contradict her or hurt her feelings because Mrs Cortans had an incredible bun on top of her head that was so high it was probably a sign of pure magic. My mother got ill. We saw her drift away little by little without being able to stop her. We held out our hands, but we couldn't touch her. We called out to her. 
but she didn't seem to hear. She stopped speaking, stopped getting up. She stayed in bed all day or sat in the big armchair in the living room, dozing in front of the TV. Sometimes, as she stared into space, she stroked my hair or my face. Sometimes she'd squeeze my hand out of the blue for no reason, and sometimes she'd kiss my eyelids. She didn't eat with us anymore, didn't do the housework. My father talked to her for hours. Sometimes he'd get angry with her. I'd hear raised voices coming from the bedroom. I tried to make out the words and the pleading. I'd glue my ears to the wall and fall asleep sitting up in bed and wake up with a start when my body slumped sideways. The following summer, we went to stay with friends at the seaside. Mum stayed in the house nearly all the time. She didn't put on her swimming costume or her sandals with the big flowers in the middle. I think she dressed the same way every day. When it occurred to her to get dressed, it was hot that year. A strange, damp, sticky sort of heat. My father and I tried to stay happy, to recapture the holiday atmosphere, but we didn't have the heart. Now I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that you can't chase away those images, let alone the invisible holes that burrow deep down inside. You can't chase away the reverberations or the memories that stir at night falls, as night falls, or in the early hours. You can't chase away echoing screams, still less echoing silence. Then, just like every other year, I went to spend a month with my grandparents in the Dordange. At the end of the summer, my father came down. He had important things to tell me. My mother had been admitted to a special hospital for people with serious depression and the name was down for a special school and my name was down for a special school called Nantes for Gifted Children. I asked my father what he was planning to do was planning to do that was special. He smiled and hugged me. I spent four years in Nantes. When I think about it now, it seems like a lot. I mean, when you count one, two, three, four school years, each with about 10 months, each month with 30 or 31 days. It seems ages, and that's not counting the hours and the minutes. Yeah, it's as if the time is folded in on itself, empty as a page left blank in an exercise book. That doesn't, that doesn't mean I can't remember anything about it, but the colours aren't true, they're blown, like in an overexposed photo. I went back to Paris every other weekend, in the beginning, I'd go to see my mother in hospital with my heart in my mouth and a feeling of dread in my stomach. Her eyes were glossy, uh, like a dead fish, her face frozen. She'd be watching the TV in the day room. I recognised her hunched body from a distance, her trembling hands. My father tried to reassure me. She was taking a lot of medicine and they had side effects, but the doctors weren't hopeful. But the doctors were hopeful. She was doing better. Later, after she got out, She'd come with him to meet the Montparnasse station. They would wait at the end of the platform. I tried to get used to her motionless, broken silhouette from a distance. We kissed unemotionally, unemotionally. My father took my bag and we'd go to the escalator. I filled my lungs with the smell of Paris and the three of us got into the car. The next day, they'd take me back to the station. Time went so quickly. Then it was time to go. Four weeks I dreamed that one Sunday my father would say, This can't go on. Stay with us. You can't be so far away. He turned the car round before we got to the station. For weeks I dreamed he the at the last traffic light or as he turned off the engine engine he'd say, This is crazy or it's ridiculous or this hurts too much. For weeks I dreamed that one day he'd put his foot down on the accelerator flat to the floor and drive all for three of us into the wall of the car park, and we'd be together forever. I ended up coming back for good. I rediscovered Paris and the bedroom that belonged to a child who was no longer me. I asked my parents to send me to a normal school for normal children. I wanted life to go back to how it was before, when everything seemed simple and connected, and we didn't have to think about it. I didn't want anything to make us different from other families anymore, where parents spoke more than four words a day, and children didn't spend their time asking themselves bad questions. Sometimes I reckon that Chloe must have been gifted too, and that's why she gave up on it all. When she understood what a struggle it was going to be, and that there was nothing that could be done, no cure, no antidote, I just want to be like other people. 
I envy their ease, their laughter, their stories. I'm sure they've got something I haven't. I've spent ages looking in the dictionary for a word that means ease, casualness, confidence. A word that I can put in my notebook in capital letters, like a magic spell. It's autumn and we're trying to pick up the threads of our life. My father got a new job. He's had the kitchen and the living room repainted. My mother's doing better. That's what he tells people on the phone. Yes, yes, Anox doing better, much better. She's recovering, little by little. Sometimes I want to grab the phone from his hand and shout at the top of my voice. No, Anyok's not better. She's not so far away from us that we can't talk to her. Anyok hardly recognises us. Four years she's been living in a parallel world that we can't reach, a sort of fourth dimension, and she couldn't care less about whether or not we're alive. When I get home, she'll be sitting in her armchair in the middle of the living room. She doesn't put the light on. I know... She sits there from morning till night without moving. She spreads a blanket over her knees and waits for time to pass. When I get back, she gets up, makes a series of gestures and movements out of habit, like she's an, on autopilot, gets a packet of biscuits out of the cupboard, puts the glasses on the table and sits down beside me without saying anything, collects the washing up, puts away what she's left and wipes the dap... What? and wipes the table with a sponge. The questions are always the same. Did you have a good day? Did you have a lot of work today? Weren't you cold in that jacket? Distractedly, she listens to my replies. We're in a role play. She's the mother and I'm the daughter. Each of us sticks to the script and follows the stage directions. She never touches me anymore. She doesn't caress my hair or my cheek or put her arm around my neck or my waist. She never hugs me. Chapter eight. I count one, two, three, four drops. I watch the ochre cloud dissolve in the water as the paint escapes the brush at the bottom of the glass. The colour spreads little by little, stains the liquid and disappears. I've been an insomniac for a long time, a word which ends like maniac and hypochondriac. It's one of those words that means something's gone off course. I take plant extract capsules in the evening after dinner and when that doesn't work, my father gives me Rivertril, a medicine that takes you into a black hole where you don't think about anything anymore. I have to take them as infrequently as possible so that I don't get used to them. But tonight, I can't get to sleep. I've been trying for hours. I'm counting everything that can be counted. Sheep's teeth, the sad man's hair, and then his freckles and beauty spots. I'm like a heap beneath the quilt. My heart's in my mouth. There are too many words in my head getting mixed up, all colliding in a giant pile-up. Scrambled phrases are fighting to get into the front, and the sheep are barring in unison in the background. Miss Bertignac, you should factor in a section on social security. Chip, do you realise you look like Tinkerbell in that hat? What time do you call this to come home? No, I don't want you to record. Uh, beer, please. Ladies, I'm going to cash up. No, I can't tomorrow. How about the next day? Umbrellas are pointless because I always lose them. Hey, let people get off before you get on. I don't know what made her agree in the end. I came back a few days later and she was outside the station in front of the police branch office. There was a whole camp of homeless people with tents, cardboard boxes, mattresses and stuff. She was standing talking to them. I went over to her and she introduced me to them straight away her face dead straight and serious. Roger, Momo, Mitchell. Then, with her hand outstretched to me, Lou Bertignac, who's come to interview me. Momo laughed. He didn't have many teeth. Roger shook hands. Oh, shook hands, and Mitchell frowned. Roger and Momo wanted me to interview them too. They were laughing. Roger made his fist into a microphone and held it under Momo's chin. So, Momo, how long's it been since you've had a bath? I felt uncomfortable, but tried not to let it show. I explained that it was for school, so that they didn't get the idea that it was going to be on the eight o'clock news, and that the project was only about women. Roger said that it was all the faults of the idiots in the government and politicians were all crap. I nodded because it seemed best to agree with him. He took a bit of dried sausage out of a plastic bag and cut some slices, which he offered round, except to Momo, probably because he didn't have enough teeth to eat it. I didn't dare say no. Even if I have to admit, it really didn't appeal at all. 
but I was too scared to risk annoying him. I swallowed it almost whole without chewing. It tasted rancid. I don't think I've ever eaten anything as bad as that, even in the school canteen. Noah and I went off to the cafe. I told her that her friends were nice and she stops and said, on the streets you don't have friends. That night when I got home, I wrote that down in my notebook. Okay, everybody, that is all I'm reading today. I really hope you have enjoyed and hopefully we'll tune in tomorrow for the next episode. Bye.